telling a Christmas story, well, re-recording it. Um, it's a story from Boston in 1964. And as I'm sat here recording this now in 2022, it's very hard to imagine that all this happened 59 years ago. The title of the story at that time was Cubs Needing Transport. But I prefer a title I've just thought up, which is The World Around Us Came to a Resounding Halt. If you can picture the scene, it was about 5 p.m. on the Saturday before Christmas in the centre of Boston, Lincolnshire, UK. When the football team from the first Boston Sea Scout Cubs managed to stop the local Salvation Army band, who'd been happily playing Christmas music outside the White Hart Hotel. And on with the story. I'd almost forgotten this story until reminded of the incident while writing the Sea Scout bus. This story is from several years previously, in fact before Ruth and I were married, so it puts this at about 1964. We were both members of the first Boston Sea Scout Cubs at this time. I forget who was the actual leader or our Kayla. We'd swap places at some stage as Ruth continued her post-SRN midwifery training at Queen Charlotte's Hospital in London. The origin of this tale is Cub Scout football matches in the Boston and District League. Their reason for our Cubs to be constantly losing their football matches was that they were Sea Scout Cubs and they were sticking to that. The boys were enthusiastic enough and had a good trainer in Mr Worthington, one of the Scout parents. Perhaps they lacked the aggression or capacity to attack that the opposition seemed to constantly possess. I suppose a good illustration of typical opposition was the 4th Boston Curtain Cubs. Their long-established male leader regarded defeat of a football match as a personal failure. Fanatical would best describe his attitude and naturally, being typical cub-age boys, they picked up this characteristic enthusiastically. The fourth Boston Cubs never lost a match. Some of the lady leaders in the district were equally forthright and pushed their teams forward at every opportunity. On reflection, I was probably at fault here, as I have never been really enthusiastic about football. But the district cub leaders in general had formed a football league for the different units to compete in, and the boys had, had to be given a chance to enjoy everything available to them. The week before this memorable day, our team had been playing Wibberton Cubs. Not one of the top teams in the league, but nevertheless we lost 14 to nil plus a pair of Wellingtons. The Wellingtons were not part of the team, it's just that a pair were lost and never recovered from the venue. We were now down into December and Christmas festivities were underway. We met our boys by arrangement at a spot in the town South Street called Doughty Quay, opposite the old Custom House. Much of old Boston is difficult for younger, younger readers and listeners to comprehend, as in the late 1960s the local council decided to destroy the centre of the town and its classic architectural heritage by driving an internal bypass through its heart. I must make a little comment here. Who in their wisdom has ever heard of an internal bypass? Now, in the early 21st century, when I originally wrote this story, Bostonians can see just how stupid and ineffectual this 1960s decision has been. The town is still just as desperate for a normal bypass as it always has been. Since the 1960s, in fact, when the A16 traffic was constantly forcing its way through the bottlenecks of the town. It's just that the inner bypass made the bottlenecks larger, and now with much larger vehicles and incredible volume, huge queues from in all directions in and out of the town uh, are there for most parts of the day. So, in effect, the council's original ideas of a 
proper bypass taking traffic uh, they thought would take trade away from the town has resulted in anyone with a glimmer of common sense avoiding the town like a plague. The town is steadily dying and I think this is still true in 2022. Back to the 1960s. Down on Custom House Quay, the boys were arriving in small groups from different parts of the town, complete with football boots and duffel bags. But only boys, there was no sign of parents or any other supporters with vehicles. Seatbelt regulations and their like had not even been contemplated at this, time, this period in time uh, or development of the motor transport. I was working at the Standard in Boston and still living at home. I had an arrangement with my parents that I sh shared the second car. I paid part of its running costs and did all the servicing. The car of the moment was a bright red Renault Dauphine because father had a passion for the mark and a good friend in Pete Taylor, the local Renault dealer. These remarkable little four-door cars had independent suspension, no cart springs, and the engine was in the rear. This left the whole of the internal floor area totally flat with no transmission tunnel and no exhaust pipe running front to back. Their main selling point was their economy. Quite capable of 50 miles per gallon, I could make my one pound fuel allocation for the week from my four pounds, 10 shillings wages last the whole week. See, in 1964, jet petrol on Sleaford Road in Boston was five gallons for a pound. Time was marching on and we had to decide how to transport the team to Freeston, about five miles out of the town. First of all, the kit, boots and duffel bags went into the boot at the front. Then we began layering the boys in the back seat, some on the floor, some sprawled with others on top. We had a blanket, a carryover from driving older, colder cars. And this came in useful later to cover our load as we passed a row of police houses down Eastwood Road. They were not all in yet though, and there was Ruth and myself the driver. I think we had two in the front with us and there must have been nine or ten in the back. They were in and out so much trying to find the most comfortable formula, cubs coming in all shapes and sizes, it's difficult to remember exactly how many we carried. I vividly remember having to send some supporter cubs home though, as at one stage we closed the doors to see how we could manage, only to find the wheels would not go round. The suspension was nice and soft, so soft that the whole car body squashed down onto the wheels at the rear. I think we had to take two or three boys out before we could actually set off. Needless to say, the team lost this match as well. Well mudded but happy at actually being able to go and play, the boys were content. The return, the return journey was uneventful until we parked the car in front of the Midland Bank and White Hart Hotel on the Boston Town Bridge. Most of the boys lived in the western side of the town and this gave them access to their routes home without going over major roads. It must have been close to 5pm. The Salvation Army band was playing Christmas carols for all the Saturday shoppers until we stole the scene. First of all, a complete noisy football team of muddy boys poured from within a very small family saloon car. Next, they collected all their boots and bags from the front, where the engine normally resides. Renault Dauphin cars were still fairly rare in those days. The bandmaster lost all control of his players as they stared in amazement. The music slowly droned to a halt as the bandsmen and their previously enthralled audience gawped in amazement. We made a swift exit before too many awkward questions were asked. There we are, that's the end of that little story from 1964. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Now, um, if you like listening to our stories, perhaps you might give us a like on this um, YouTube page and even subscribe. And then YouTube will let you know whenever we produce something different. Uh, And there's lots of more stories in the pipeline. Additionally, if you want to look at our, all our publications, you can find them on our new website. This is our second website this year, as our previous web host let us down badly. So this one is by a firm called Jimdo, and the address is www.crackerbooks.fr. Now that's easy to remember, isn't it? Crackerbooks.fr. Now, on there, you'll find links to all our publications, which are over 200 videos, uh, over 150 uh, audio stories, and there are 10 complete books. Some of them are picture story books. We think they're rather good. Anyway, you can find the links there. Um, If you look on, um, what is it, Google Chrome and Firefox, it works better. It won't work on Edge. Uh, if you, you might have to copy and paste some of the links to your browser, but they're there and they work. And there we are. Thank you for listening and what <laughs> listening and watching. Until the next time.